All right, guys, here we have the troops and commanders of early age Agartha. I affectionately call these guys my early age hippos, but that's just me. Call them what you prefer. All right, the brief. This nation loves caves and underwater. When we're playing, we receive extra golden resources and cave forts. And believe me, we're going to need it. Not primarily because extra resources means extra amazing troops, quite the opposite, but because extra resources means our shitty troops are better efficiency wise. So we aren't punished as much for recruiting them. We have perfect dark vision on everybody, except for the Olms and the Oracle of the Dead. These guys have spirit sight which is important in case anybody is dropping solar brilliance on you. It also helps against glamour spells. Now let's glance at the units. If we take a quick look at these guys, first off, they look huge, and they are. Glancing through a few of the basic troops, you'll notice the all-too-common tag of cold-blooded, which if we look, means we're going to be suffering some heavy-duty fatigue penalties if we fight in the cold. Remember all that for our pretender design later. We really don't want to be suffering from this fatigue. In addition, you'll notice everybody is a full-blown amphibian. I don't know why it describes them as poor amphibians. I haven't found a poor amphibian tag. They all have the full amphibian tag except the troglodytes. That's, I don't understand. Maybe that's something from an older Dominions. I believe in Dom 5 they were full amphibians as well, so perhaps it's a Dom 4 thing. They seem perfectly suited to go underwater and stay there. Maybe not against a true water nation, but they'd have a shot at holding down the water pretty strongly against other land nations. In general, we have one more consistency. All of our troops suck at fighting. Low attack and defense scores are extremely limiting, and even our super high cost sacred unit, the seal guard, only has an attack density of 1 per square with an attack of 11. This immediately tells me not to worry about attack or defense based blesses despite the fact that we have recruit in any castle sacreds. Not these guys, but the Stone Hurlers and the Ancient Ones would be our melee version. The huge amounts of HP, however, tell us exactly what to do with this nation. Focus on being big balls of hit points and summon our damage sources along with our ohms. I'm going to be quick with troops because they don't stand out too much. There are a couple things you really want to pay attention to. Pale One Militias. All Militias are pretty terrible. These guys are extra terrible. But one thing to notice is the 18 hit points for only 6 gold. That's amazing. But also, Siege Strength. Agartha specializes in everything related to castles. Absolutely everything related to castles. These dudes literally eat stone walls, so they're going to specialize in this. You dominate castle sieges with these guys for several reasons I'm going to go over later, but to be brief, tons and tons of siege strength. And your troops also have this tag right here, need not eat. What that means is those normally annoying messages you get when you're defending a castle of your troops are starving, you'll never get those. You can lock a bunch of these guys in a castle and nobody can root them out. They can sit there forever. As long as they have the defense strength, Ulm is an exactly particular particularly siege defensive, but a lot of these guys have a castle defense bonus, so keep an eye on them. The final thing to note about troop types is every single one of these terrible troops becomes far more capable of killing after an Ulm stuns somebody. These Ulms with their mind blast hit somebody and stun them when they fail their magic resist check. That stunned troop goes down to zero defense and zero attack. The defense means we can't miss, which is great because our dudes are really good at missing, and the zero attack means they can't repel, which is great because our dudes don't have great morale. So we want to orient our entire armies around this and we'll find success. Pale ones. Never really recruit these guys unless you're in desperate need for chaff or siege strength. They have no helmets, no armor. There's one of them here that has a buckler. And this is new from Dominions 5. Sticks and stones. They never used to throw these. They just had the spear. It can be fun to throw sticks and stones. Nine blunt can do some damage, but it's small enough of a situation you don't really want to build armies around this, I don't think. But the primary problem with the pale ones and the wet ones is that they just don't have enough armor and helmets to keep them alive, even with their big sacks of HP. Generally speaking, I prefer Pale One Warriors. These guys have decent protection for a low gold cost, but these guys also have a cap and a buckler. If you look, his resources are 17. If you look at the other guy whose resources are only 10, he loses his hat. That's not good. Generally speaking, especially in early age when people focus on archery a little more, if you take the guy without the hat, I don't think it's worth the loss in resources. Losing that hat is going to get you killed with a lot of headshots. I don't like losing the hat, so I always prefer to go with the guy with the hat whenever possible. And remember, the difference in resources is seven per troop, but these guys can be recruited in all forts and all caves. So if you manage to get underground, you can just go to every province in a line and start recruiting the higher resource guys. And as your troop fairy guys are walking along, they can collect them and bring them to your armies. So there's really no advantage to picking the guy without the hat. I don't see an advantage to it. Now, the cavern guard, which I consider like a pale warrior, pale one warrior, has really high damage. If you look at these guys, they only have 15 damage. The other one has 15. They're all still terrible at hitting, but this guy gets 
a 25 damage hit. Really punches through pretty much anything, and you have the advantages of both slash and piercing on this guy. This guy hits like a truck. So if you're going to recruit some of these guys, cavern guards are the ones to go for, in my opinion. Unless you really need the shield for some reason, which I don't see that a shield would be a trade-off versus the damage. Remember, if you get enough of these guys, eventually somebody's going to hit somebody. And when they hit somebody, that somebody will explode in blood. That's kind of the thing to remember. We have troglodytes to glance at. These guys are kind of meme -y. They t trample. If you have anything that's really easy to trample and really hard to fight otherwise, go ahead and grab a couple of these guys. Otherwise, I really didn't use these guys very much. They make good little tiny parties, but the problem is when you throw a troglodyte lord with a bunch of trogs down, they're a neutral troop. I mean, when you go running out, they still have low magic resist. They're not going to be very effective against other players. They're easy targets. So in my opinion, I stayed away from the trogs. They're just too expensive. Look that up. Compare that to your massive upkeep here. Half that? Less than half of that? A, li a little too expensive for my taste. If they lower the cost, sure, but a little too expensive for my taste. Finally, our sacreds. Stone hurlers, these guys, are hilarious for one reason, and that's they are in our siege defense. They are part of our siege defenders. So anytime you build a castle, let me see if I can show you, you have stone hurlers on the walls. Any defenders on the walls have infinite ammunition, so if you can clog up the middle of your castle, these guys will be throwing rocks that are doing 28 damage down on people's heads, which is absolutely hilarious because head hits, damage is increased 25% before armor is deducted. These guys will be not caring about protection whatsoever. Good luck elf nations blitzing through the middle of an Agarthan castle. They're absolutely hilarious. Can you say bonk? All right, boys, and here's the example of the hilarity that can ensue when you are dramatically outmatched in a castle battle, somebody sieging you, and you have boulder throwers up on the walls. If you manage to jam pack the middle, we are against Tirnanog here. Their troops have 16 to 25 defense skill. My troops have nine attack skill. We're not going to be able to hit anybody, but the boulder throwers don't care about any of that. They just throw their boulders. So let's see what happens. We only have eight of them, but they are doing some work. Hit, 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 tons of hits, tons of hits, just chucking boulders everywhere. And despite the really high defense of these elves, they really don't care with their boulders. The infinite ammo, the big boulders, there we go. And look at that. So there you go. If you ever have to defend your walls, defend them with boulder throwers. Otherwise, your ancient ones you can get at any castle. These guys have a basic spear, nothing to really lean on. Okay protection, great hit points. Same thing, sacred, cold-blooded. Your real sign is your cap-only seal guard. These guys are great because they have a 34 damage obsidian glaive. This thing has great length, great damage, and it's a magic weapon. So it takes care of any of those sacreds rushing around with ethereal early game. Kind of just specifically for that, because otherwise they're quite a bit of cost to get anything out of them. Again, they just have too low attack and defense skills to really make anything amazing out of them, at least in terms of what I could figure out. Finally, the Great Ulm, the enabler of the nation. They hold people still so our fat little hands can get on them, and whenever a Great Ulm mind blasts somebody, remember their defense hits zero and their attack hits zero. No repels, no defense, no keeping away from our massive damage. Easiest way to kill creatures with our garbage units, so we're going to focus on that in Pretender Creation. When you go underwater, you can get these wet ones. These guys are awful. Just awful. You can get these ancient wet ones to take your sacred bless, but there's nothing really redeeming about these guys. They're just watery sacreds that you can recruit in underwater forts. Now let's get to our commanders. Our scout is not that great. 50 stealth. I mean, not much else you can say about a scout. Even the scout though, still some siege strength. Pale one commander is not a terrible leader, you know, plus zero. But other than that, why would you get him? I mean, maybe I would use these guys to ferry troops around, but that's pretty much it. They can carry a good amount of troops, but can't carry any magic troops, can't carry any undead. So later on, like mid game, they can't really ferry all my troops around either, so I don't bother too much with them. Trog Lords can be meme -y. You create some kind of armor, you know, black steel plate or something cheap, and throw it on a Trog Lord. He can stomp most province defense. Like, six province defense gets stomped by a black steel plated Trog Lord. Problem is, with the magic resist of eight, way too vulnerable to player counters. So there's really nothing you can lean on too much with it. Ancient Lords, however, are our only way to get line formations, and they have Inspirational, which solves a lot of our morale issues. So these guys are great for leading troops around in line formations if you want them. Engraver is just about 
the best researcher in early age. These guys give us nine research. A look at that low cost, 38 gold per year, 95 gold to purchase. These guys are phenomenal. Just they have the adept researcher tag and they're just phenomenal for research and it gets exponentially better when you get magic paths. I don't slam these out as much as I probably should, but you can put these guys pretty much anywhere that you have a cave. So if you want to throw down a lab and a temple, it's pretty expensive without a castle, but you can and pump these guys out theoretically. I wouldn't focus on that. I would kind of just throw these guys up in whatever castle you can, but they're not great battle mages. So I prefer to focus on these guys, the earth readers. These guys are a little better just because they have the fortune teller tag. They have earth two, which is a great buff path. And they get one other path in addition to that, as opposed to just earth one, like the engravers. Engravers are great for research, but again, earth readers are better for pretty much everything. You have bless for your sacred troops. You have earth two, which is great for buffing because you can get to earth three with summon earth power. There's just a lot more advantages to these guys if you can afford them. Ulm sages are great if you really want water spells. These guys are the guys that make your underwater adventures a little easier because they, you know, dropping quickness on great ulms is absolutely hilarious to see. But these guys are just kind of a saving, a saving grace if you want to go underwater. They're poison resistant too, so you can do some quirky things, throwing items on them. They don't really have the paths I would want if I wanted to focus on a foul vapors strategy, but it's doable. They've got quite a bit of water they can do and a little bit of point buffing, and they're also fortune tellers. Finally, the oracles. The three oracles that are cap only, we have one version that's water, we have one version that's fire, and we have one version that's death. The death one you'll note is the only one with spirit sight, but they all have the fortune teller tag, and they're all phenomenal battle mages. They all get an extra path of one of their two paths, and they're all level three priests, which makes it so much easier to divine blessing your sacreds and solves you a lot of problems. In general, these guys are phenomenal as buffers, but you know, if you're looking for something simple, let's say you get a water two, you don't want to have this oracle spamming frozen heart. You'd rather have a couple ohm sages to spam frozen heart. You know what I mean? You don't want to be wasting these expensive 515 gold two turn recruitment troops on that. You want these guys to be casting your big spells. They can cover point buffs in a pinch and can thump army formations with things like maws of the earth. Because remember, if nobody can move, Agartha isn't that slow. But you really want these guys focused around the big battlefield wide buffs and things that you can do so that their actions are more efficient in terms of time. And finally, our sites, Halls of the Oracles lets us scry, but more importantly gives us the oracles. Roots of the Earth gives us three earth gems, which is great for summons and one fire gem. The Chamber of the Seal itself gives us one death gem, which is apparently that's all we get for having doom looming over our heads forever with the penumbrals trying to come out. And then the Womb of the Earth gives us one water gem and our friends, the Olms. Now let's get the Pretender creation to take advantage of these guys' strengths and cover for their weaknesses. All right, guys, here we are at Pretender creation for Agartha. I chose with Agartha to go with the Worm. I liked the Regen, the Fear, the Amphibian. It kind of fits our nation. More importantly, I wanted to select it specifically because we have a couple of requirements. If you look really closely at Great Olms, the Mind Blast, the way it works is every time they attack with this, it's a fatigue cost of five. Once they hit fatigue 50, they can't use this anymore. If people drop Curse of Stones on you or they get fatigued out because of cold temperatures, they get slowed down a lot. So I really wanted Reinvigoration just in case these guys got hit with any fatigue problems. In addition to the fact that these big fat boys all feel like they need Reinvigoration. That might just be an emotional thing of mine, but it sure feels like an Encumbrance 6 fat troop with low troop density is really going to be needing some Reinvigoration to keep themselves going. And more Reinvigoration is always a great maid bless because it keeps every mage going. And the more our mages are going, the more they're point buffing our troops and the better our troops are doing. So what I ended up doing is I buffed the magic paths up to six each. I didn't want pull from the grave. I wanted purifying water. Just kidding. Good Lord, I wish. But I went to the bless effects. I gave us cold resistance because that will help us. If you look at our cold blooded, cold resistance reduces the penalty by 50%. So this cuts the reinvigoration or rather the fatigue penalty down by 50%, which is great. And then if we add reinvigoration in as well, that gives us more of a generic bless. Yes, we could go with two cold resist and one reinvigoration, but I felt this was more generalized, which is better because it allows us to answer more problems. And then our final would be hard skin. Hard skin is great because if you look at these guys, for example, sealed guards, they only have three natural protection. So if you add five more to that, it goes up to eight. And then when you cast your spells on these guys to buff, let's say somebody casts iron skin on him, it will grant natural protection up 13, which puts it up to 21, but it'll stop at 20. That gives these guys natural protection 20. It's right at that perfect point where you don't really have to worry too much about it. And you can do the same thing with stone skin. It'll be plus 10 and that'll put it up to 18, but it'll stop at 15. Same sort of thing. It just seems to fit right in that perfect point where these guys will get the maximal amount of natural protection for themselves that they can right up to 20. So I didn't really need more and that seemed to help a lot with my expansion. So I wanted to focus on that. But once we do this, primary 
reasons I take heat, took enough of that, I took death, and I decided to take magic. I wanted magic because I wanted to abuse the fact that my engravers are insanely good at research anyway. All of my guys are fairly good at research, but I really wanted to push these engravers really hard to get my research high. I also wanted heat because that way we're not fighting in cold lands, so we're not suffering from those fatigue penalties. And I took death primarily because none of our troops eat any food. I understand death will over time lower income of our nation, but they nerfed that from Dominions 5 to Dominion 6. So now the income gain from growth is not nearly as much. So I didn't worry about that too much. We had a save point somewhere. This is a great place. The reason I didn't take Misfortune is primarily because I didn't want to lose out on our many heroes. We have a boatload of national heroes that show up and one of them that has infinite heroes that just keep popping up over and over. And those heroes were pretty good. So I really didn't want to screw this up luck wise. We need enough order and enough productivity to be able to pump out our troops. And that put us at a satisfying zero points. So this is the one that I saved. This is the one I recommend you use. And now really briefly, I'm going to go over the heroes. Also, one last thing before I forget, guys, I went with a pretender that was water, earth, and I prioritized early expansion because Agartha struggles with that quite a bit. And this early pretender chassis gave us a really good setup for early stuff, as well as good site searcher and everything later on. There is an alternate way to play this nation where you kind of emphasize death a lot more. You can see we have a lot of death summons. We have a lot of things that we can benefit from, like Well of Misery. We could benefit from Tartarian Gate, a lot of these things. But the most important one would be Utter Dark. Utter Dark giving darkness minus six to everybody in the world and minus 90% income and resources is very, very, very powerful since caves and deep seas are exempt from income reduction. And though that's where you benefit the most. You go underwater, you go in the caves, and you make sure you fight everybody because you have perfect dark vision or spirit sight, so you ignore all of this. However, the main reason I don't particularly aim myself towards this massive death setup is it requires too much investment for me to be comfortable. There's no real good death bless effects that I really want on this nation. Possibly fear, but I don't really want to do that big of an investment just for fear. And also, if you ever cast this in a multiplayer game and you have multiple players who don't want this around, you will find a lot of people on your doorstep all of a sudden, and it's really not going to end well for you. So it's just kind of combining all those things. I particularly don't like playing with a super death heavy emphasis because I feel like we get plenty of death just playing it as we have with this particular pretender setup. All right, guys, I wanted to go over the main reason I didn't take misfortune scales. I like national heroes we get for Agartha. We have a lot of these members of the closed council we have the ancient Ulm deep thought we have Ogon the earth blooded all of these guys really enable us in certain ways so if you look we have a death three with obsidian eye that's phenomenal that opens us up to a lot of things we can do with death but I just like how he fits right into our oracle position lapis or lapis is water and death this opens up a couple things we can do as well including including some forgeable items moss agate is really good for getting us in nature stuff especially nature site searching getting us a lot more gems. That's something that's really, we can really capitalize on. Nature 2 is a lot better than Nature 1, and Nature 1 is generally what we find in independent mages. So this is really helpful. Deep Thought, not so much of an enabler. Um, water 3, which you can boost to Water 4 with, you know, water power underwater. I mean, he's still a good guy showing up, good to use. And Ogon, fire two, nothing really special, just kind of like another Oracle, but with a five earth path, which makes him insanely good for doing battlefield wide buffs and battlefield wide spells. But the ones that respawn over and over are these Ulm spawns. If you look, they have a magic path, a possible path, fire, water, earth, or death. So you start with water and earth and you can get fire, water, earth, or death on top of that. These guys are decent commanders. They have 150 leadership, which makes makes them one of our best. But in fact, I think it is our best. They also have magic leadership. They don't have undead leadership. If you really wanted to on your bless, you could take some to make it so they hold everything, but you don't really need to. You have enough death mages with your oracles. These guys are just great. And believe it or not, Agarthan heroes pop up more than you would expect. I don't know what it is with Agartha, but heroes show up all the time and these guys show up all the time for me. So it's primarily why I wanted to go over the heroes really quickly. I don't like to go too deep on the heroes because once you get that deep in the woods, these videos would take three hours for me to go through all the disgusting things we could do and all the little nasty tricks we could do with these guys, but, you know, foul vapors, for example. But I really don't want to dive that deep into it. I just kind of wanted to briefly brush over them so you know exactly why we're not crippling our luck scales on this nation. All right, guys, now we're going to start talking about some of Akartha's early summons in the early age. We've got a couple spells. We look at level three conjuration, which is commonly why Agarthonians, I guess we'll call them, rush conjuration level three. There's Ruax Pact, where we spend two fire gems and we get three magma children. 
There is Barathras Pact, where we spend three Earth Gems to get two Earth Elementals. There's Bind Penumbral, where you spend one Death Gem to get one Penumbral. And there's Revive Cavern Whites, where you get eight Death Gems, five Cavern White. Now remember, in Dominions 5, we got Magma Children, two Gems for five Magma Children. Now we only get three Magma Children for the same cost. That being said, they still fill a particularly necessary niche for us. And the primary reason for that is because they have a Flame Strike that is Area of Effect 1, which is phenomenal. This is the reason that people in Dominions 5 always use, you know, the Frost Brand or the Fire Brand, because it had an Area of Effect 1 attack, kind of like a little miniature fireball walking around. Now, you only get three of them, so it's far less efficient. But these guys, if you look, you don't see Spirit Form on this guy. So you can still Protection buff him. He kept the same stats for the most part, but he has great things. And especially Especially since we're going to be running a Heat Dominion, he has Firepower. So he gets a lot more powerful in Hot Provinces, has Spirit Sight, has a Magic Flame Strike attack. Now, I have two points of experience on this guy, so his attack skill is normally not this high, but it, or, nor his defense skill. But the thing you have to keep in mind is anybody that has short range attacks, hit and fire shield. Anybody that's just near him, getting Heat Fatigued out. He's got tons of fire resistance, tons of poison resistance, so he goes good with your other summons. These Magma Children fill a very particular niche, because if you have troops that you're ordinary troops are failing to hit, failing to survive through. You're looking at these big dorks here, they can't hit anybody. But if you have magma children, you can put these guys either interspersed in with your own troops, if they have some sort of fire resist or something to negate the heat fatigue, or you can just use them as your front line. They're cheap enough. You're spending two fire gems for three magma children. I mean, that's three troops for two gems. That's a little expensive, but these troops are very, very powerful and very, very good to use. But for two earth gems, remember, we used to get one earth elemental. Now we get two for three. But there's another thing to notice. The earth elementals in Dominions 5, you used to have, what, 40 hit points, 38 hit points, 28, something like that. These have 70, and they have reconstruction 8%. I think they had regeneration 10% in Dominions 5, but now they have basically regeneration 8%. But that 8% of that those hit points are way higher, and they trample size 6. They're great troops. So this is something I didn't really use in Dominions 5, but I'm definitely going to use it here. Pen Umbrals, these little guys that you get, they're still pretty expensive, because primarily you only get one when you cast the spell, and it only costs you one death gem. It's one death gem. Gem, which means essentially if you look at your mages this is the only guy that can cast this spell now we might find one here with an earth reader but the spell itself bind penumbral requires the death if you don't have one of these guys laying around with a death random that can cast the spell then you have to go use these guys and that's a huge waste of time i would never cast the spell with these guys if i needed penumbrals i would make sure i had a death random of the earth reader casting the spell because that's the only way that's even possibly beneficial and then the other downside is if you're Remember, in Dominions 5, a big way to use these guys was to, if you summoned these guys, I mean, most people didn't summon them. They summoned the full Umbrals with 68 hit points. But let's say you did need Ethereal Troops that were stealthy or cold resistant or whatever you're looking for. You would use these guys and protection buff them so they would last a lot longer. Then you'd have a high protection. You know, with Iron Warriors, you'd have 20 protection. You'd have Ethereal. You'd have Life Drain. These guys would become monstrous. However, now in Dominion 6, Spirit Form, you can't be affected by iron skin, skeletal body, anything like that. So the problem with that is these penumbrals are really already at their maximum form. They can't really be buffed up that much. I mean, you could give them a strength buff. You can give them all sorts of stuff like that, but you really can't make them more durable. And that's a problem for something that takes one mage turn and a death gem. In Dominions 5, the other death summon at this level was the cavern whites. And you got eight death gems for three whites back in Dominions 5, but now you get eight death gems for five whites, which is a much better deal. And these whites have 19 morale, 30 damage on their glaive, cold fatigue people out. They're cold and poison resistant like any undead would be. These guys are solid troops. You know, normally in Dominions 5 when you only got three of them, I didn't really think it was that good of a deal. But now that you're getting five for the same amount of death gems, I still think it's expensive. It's a little expensive because you already have plenty of troops with lots of hit points. But 30 damage, chill aura, good protection whites, that's the thing that sets them aside. Because if you throw, you know, stone skin or iron skin on top of these guys, they're going to go up to 15 or 20 protection, natural protection, they're going to get up to 23, 24, maybe even 25 total protection. These guys are actually a powerhouse in terms of durability. And if you're already earth mauling people so they can't avoid getting hit by this, these guys can really be pretty tanky. And the best part is one spell cast gets you five of them. That's the key. One spell cast gets you five. Shifts the balance slightly. Honestly, I don't personally want either one. I don't really have any use for an ethereal troop because all that does is multiplies the amount of hit points you have. And I already have tons of hit points 
points for cheaper and white cavern whites are kind of the same way but if i was going against something that in particular was weak to undead i can't think of anything but chill aura might be beneficial but then i have to carefully script these guys so they don't choke out my own people not quite sure what i would do with these i don't think i'd use these or the penumbrals but if i did have to use one since you can't protection buff spirit form troops i would push it in the further direction of cavern whites if i didn't have anything better to do with death gems so finally we'll go to the bind umbral spell which is much later in conjuration i think it's seven this guy is actually pretty useful 22 magic damage armor piercing and it life drains so his hp just keeps going up and up and up and up ethereal troop still great but again same problem spirit form you can't protection buff this guy. So while you can strength of giant him and have him do a pretty good job of keeping himself alive with his life drain, it's still one guy per square. He's going to get surrounded and he, if they have magic weapons, he's going to get chopped up. And that's just expensive for me. It doesn't seem very worth it for me now that you can't buff these guys' protections and make them little tanks. If you could buff their protections and make them little tanks, these guys would be a problem for people. But you just can't anymore. People with magic weapons are just going to chop this guy up into little pieces and there's nothing else I can do. The only time I would consider these is if I wanted to do some kind of hilarious stealthy maneuver and sneak them in and elf somebody with Agartha just for the irony. But now if you go to enchantment five, there is a spell in here, living mercury for six water gems. This thing is phenomenal. So if you look at this thing, we had this in dominions five and in dominions five, I believe it had 48 hit points. It had 48 hit points for seven gems. Now you're in dominion six. It only costs six gems for one and it has 140 freaking hit points. These things are amazing. They're are disgusting in Dominion 6. You now get 140 hit points for the same spell with less gem cost. This thing has 328 damage armor piercing attacks. It drops poison as it walks like a professional crop duster and its morale is perfect. I know we can't buff these spirit form summons anymore. We won't be able to protection buff this guy, but man, this thing is just durable as hell with that fortitude effect he has. It can half damage from everything that hits him. And I know TNG can summon these too, but it just feels so right with Agartha and not so much with that pansy human nation. Try these guys out. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Living Mercuries are like the anti-thug group. You get three or four of these with a commander and put them in a battle against a thug, that thug's gonna get beaten to death. Try it out.